that while, while we were writing this book, the situation changed. And so a great deal of interest, um, a great deal more in, in, intense interest in, in reducing our carbon emissions during that five years. And then just more recently, we had the COVID pandemic, uh, which has suddenly focused on health and in particular in relation to buildings, uh, hygiene, uh, air, uh, air quality and hygiene. And of course, in the last, not, not, not content with just that as a, as a disruption, in the last uh, six months, the Ukraine war has suddenly focused our dependence on energy and uh, the importance of its security. Um, one of the issues in the uh, in the book is that should healthy building be expensive and in a way this is related to resources should we need a lot of resources to make buildings healthy so uh, a, a, a principle that we have tried to apply was that uh, we're not looking for expensive solutions and by expensive i mean expensive in resources in energy and in money so not and and one of the things that worried us is that many of the illustrations that we will find if you found in the book they kind of sum up a rather um affluent lifestyle and of course affluent lifestyle is maybe healthy for the the the, the humans but is not healthy for the planet so we were very concerned about that now, now to, to, to step to, to move to something that is um, more uh, le le less discursive and more specific, one of the things we addressed was designing for access to nature. And this suddenly became sharply into, into focus with the uh, pandemic. And also this slide gives you an, an idea of our approach. We, we didn't want many, there have been many books about um, writing uh, about healthy design and good design and often they're sort of exhortations they're kind of not based on a, on on actually any analytical work but more on a belief so we tried as a principle not to say anything that was just our opinion but something that is backed up by 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 um some hard research and in this instance here uh i'm just going to get a pointer um the laser pointer. In this instance here, which is concerned about our access from, to nature, we have tried to be quite analytical about it. We have see, realized that there are ways of access. One means physical access, the actual uh, contact with nature physically. The other is sensory access by vision, possibly smell, possibly sound. And we've had a, we've proposed a sort of mechanism by which we, a structure by which we can quantify those. And um, we base this upon uh, written research published in, in, in refereed journals. So you can see here that uh, in this slide, we're simply uh, saying where these ideas came from. They weren't just kind of dreamed up as, as, as some. As, uh, uh, and in fact, to take this example further, we're talking about access to nature. Um, we, those two last two slides show distinct contrast here this has the almost perfect gradation of um, we've, we've identified it inside we've identified edge near and far and these are all contiguous so they there is wonderful access for that person but that same bit of nature might be separated and here we see an example of where um, a, a dweller on the third floor of a, of a block of flats is separated this is the journey they would make in order to have their access to nature and it is not a one to um, envy um, and in the end nature gets squeezed out and it gets squeezed out of their lives really because the access is so um, bad uh, although the, if we don't un we don't get this from looking at simply the proportion of of green space in in in, in or in urban and suburban areas, we only get this if we carry out an analysis of this kind. So that's the sort of thing that we were doing. It's an example. Um, we were very interested, and we advocated in the book the attracting wildlife into cities. So, if where there is poor um, access to 
existing wildlife, then it's a very good idea to attract it. And um, this can be done at all sorts of scales. Here, obviously, a massive operation, um, these green corridors that come through into the cities. And here is, in fact, building a, a settlement around green space, but re right down to very small scale detailed design. Um, and even these are start, swallow starter homes, and this is a, a bird feeder come um, a satellite dish. So there are all levels we can attract. In fact, we are unwittingly attracting quite a lot of wildlife into our cities uh, due to our waste food. Uh, uh, but this is, this is a more perhaps a creative and a benefit to humans as well. Um, and another way that we might sort of unwittingly begin to see much more greenness at least, and that is in the production of food. So there has been, uh, whereas planting around buildings began partly for decorative reasons, partly as sort of architectural statement, there has been interest in this as a, as a, as a cooling function. But in fact, what is going to happen, what could happen, is that it will become a serious method of creating food. So vertical farming or vertical uh, crop growing will become um, something we're going to see in, in the future. Um, we also speculate about density. There is this, um, at the end of the lecture, you, there are some more slides and you'll see some amazing, which I'm not going to show because it's not time, but some amazing um, uh, um, bar charts that show, uh, three-dimensional bar charts that show densities of cities. And it's, it, when you see that, you begin to wonder why we uh, build our cities at such high densities. And, um, and then just outside the, these very low densities, um, this is a, like a section of, of about 50 miles from Inner, inner London to into Essex. And, uh, and so maybe there's a kind of optimum density whereby there is sufficient exposure to um, the green space and perhaps room to, to farm and grow food. So we might be looking for what I would call a high density rural environment rather than um, this at the moment. What we do is we, we have a high density environment and then we all jump in our cars and it doesn't really matter whether they're electric or not they still make huge demands on the environment and rush off to the countryside and stress certain points in that so that is not logical we, we should perhaps think about again reverting to living amongst nature and potential for food growth um, again, the thing, the, the results of our urban life is um, all sorts of stresses. One is noise. I'm not going to go into detail here, but just this sort of illustrates to you the kind of things we must, that the designer can grapple with. But often it is left to the planner and the road planner to deal with issues like this. And it could be something now that comes more into the design realm of, of the architect and planner. Um, there are technical solutions to these things, and we tried to show here that they're sometimes quite, you know, not rocket science, they're quite easy, sound reflects, sound is absorbed, sound is screened, uh, sound is transmitted within buildings, which causes a great deal of, of distress and neighbour irritation. And again, in this slide, we've included references to where of this, the impact. There's a huge amount of literature on the impact of environmental noise on, on, on mental health. Uh, and again, the, the results of densification and the transport that seems to go with it is of course the urban pollution microclimate, which is a growing stress. In fact, I've seen some World Health Organization statistics which says that almost half the pop world population live in conditions which are, are substandard due to urban pollution. So this is a pretty um, devastating statistic. Uh, and the, at a micro level, we can just see understanding these things are, are possibly solutions. Uh, for example, that, you know, we can have a wind, a prevailing wind in this direction, but is actually the block A, the, the face that is away from the wind that is actually getting most of the pollution. And this, this has been studied. There's a lot of very advanced computer modeling available, data is available. What, what do we do about it? I see 
housing being built, new housing being built, facing busy roads, and I think nothing's being done about it. Uh, it simply isn't being looked at. And over here, I, I have some examples of how design can begin to make solutions, very modest solutions, but here we have a noisy, busy road, um, but, and it faces south, so the temptation would be south facing windows, and, and, and yet, um, of course, that's where the noise and the pollution comes from. So, so we, we're saying that for visual points of view, looking out on a sunlit space is as good and possibly better with global warming than having sun streaming into the building. And here we've a bit more on advanced solution. We're looking at the manipulation of, of um, the pressures over a building to uh, uh, allow the building to be ventilated from a much cleaner air. Incidentally, the density of pollution um, near roads is very variable. It's, it's got a whole sort of microstructure and if we really understand it, we can uh, learn how to expose people less to pollution, even though, even without kind of completely removing those pollution sources. It's all a matter of how quickly this pollution is diluted into the upper air. And this approach here, um, which seems terribly obvious, you draw your air from the, the nice clean garden rather than the dirty road. It's just a question of how you achieve that. Um, adaptive comfort, this is a subject really on its own, which has received a lot of interest in the last few decades. And our conventional comfort theory says there is an optimum temperature um, at which we are comfortable. And we, we, we followers of the adaptive comfort theory say, no, there isn't. All that you have to do is to provide thermal balance and you have to achieve your core temperature over a period of time and that you do this by constantly uh, behavioral responses so if you're cold you seek somewhere warm if you're hot you seek somewhere cool or cool beer or something like that and that maintains long-term balance and if you can do that easily if you can make those adaptations you are happy you're in a form of well-being like when you can sit down to a good meal and you're hungry and that's that brings a pleasure and so that's we've evolved that technique to make us um, maintain our heat balance whereas the engineer or at least the comfort engineer has tended to say no there's one temperature we're going to deliver that at all costs and, and and that's where you'll be comfortable well first of all you're not always comfortable because you've got a thermal history and secondly uh, it has cost the earth an awful lot of energy it costs about half of our our emissions are associated in some way with building conditioning, either actually directly or indirectly. So it, it is a, it is a very it's it's a principle that has led us into trouble. So what we're saying here is that we need something called we call adaptive opportunity, and that is the ability, as illustrated here, to move into a cooler part of the room, to move closer to a heat source. Um, we need adaptive opportunity to, in effect, extend our comfort zone. So here we have good adaptive opportunity and we have a wide comfort zone which can uh, tolerate large swings of some stimulus, let's say it's temperature in this case. As we narrow down the adaptive opportunity, we find that very quickly we get outside it and this causes stress. If we remove adaptive opportunity altogether, then we're immediately into stress as soon as we uh, go outside this narrow neutral zone. So clearly this requires much more energy because we're having to take heat out of the system here and put heat into the system here than, a, than one knows this. So adaptive opportunity is really where things are going because it not only meets comfort and health, but it also meets um, a, a low energy agenda. So this is something I, I underlined for you to, to take an interest in. We're also looking at the idea of really local comfort systems. Um, here it's called personal comfort systems. I would refer to it more as local. Um, and this is something that for a long time we've been interested in, in passive form. This was it's a proposal for a design in the tropical island climates where you have the problem of wanting large flows of air 
of uh, for cooling but you also want uh, light but you don't want direct sunlight so this just shows you how this very small zone we'll sort of call it a micro zone is designed in relation to the person here we're actually obviously going even one step further and talking about designing uh, heated clothing but this is being taken quite seriously uh, and we're asking the question what is the smallest amount of energy we need to provide thermal health now you notice we're we've invented this new term thermal health rather than thermal comfort comfort has a sort of soggy neutral feel about it as if it's going to make you go to sleep or something of that kind now that isn't what we that isn't the most pleasant um, concept because we all know that we enjoy um, sensing temperature we enjoy uh, a, a warm fire or, or a, a, a cooling breeze so uh, clearly thermal health isn't just about this sort of neutral comfort um, okay let's move on um, the book looks at the effects of sunlight and daylight there's the enormous um, uh, advocacy of daylight quite correctly um, we were very lucky to be supported by Velux earlier on in the preparation of this book although they didn't contribute directly to the book they contributed to a number of seminars that were held before the book which were sort of precursors to it and the idea of the book actually came from Velux so we're very grateful for that and um, the uh, obviously the the a lot of issues were uh, about sunlight and daylight and it's interesting on one hand would have somebody giving at a seminar saying how much we need more light and then we have another, another person that represented a slightly different um, health uh, interest and they were saying how dangerous light was in terms of cancers and, uh, and so on. So we tried to unravel this by looking at the relative um, papers or important papers and reports and try and produce this table of the uh, benefits and disbenefits and uh, this was it was sort of recognized by Corbusier who drew this cartoon here of the sun and it's meant to represent the good and the evil of the sun because of course in his case he was not thinking so much of, of person health but sort of building health in terms of overheating of buildings and the pleasure that sunlight in a building gives you so we have we have um we architects really have this kind of dual relationship with the sun and as as global warming proceeds then clearly we're shifting that emphasis a little bit towards am i okay to continue because i realize i've already um because i started late gone over my time okay sorry um, nick um i don't know whether you can hear me can you i can hear you yes yeah, um, I think it would be welcome if you could try to wrap up in about three minutes. I'll wrap up in three minutes. Okay, I'm very happy to do that. I, I was going to do that. Wow. Okay, changing employment patterns. This was being accentuated by the COVID. Um, this puts more importance on uh, thermal, on, on healthy building, healthy homes, uh, and, and also homes that maybe mix uh, social contact more, which... Um, uh, and then extreme events, and we, we never thought we'd be saying this, but so many houses now, uh, homes have suffered from extreme events, even in, in our climates, and this is increasing. So do we have to begin to think about um, uh, designing for droughts, strong winds, floods, and, uh, and, and fires? <laughs> so my conclusions uh, is that, Although there is, there is plenty of evidence-based research on health and well-being, there's a great explosion of it. Its interpretation in terms of design is still not simple. Um, in other words, the parameters that people measure in their research, and it could be the, develop, the change in SAT scores of school children, or it could be the incidences of, of references to self, mental health care or something like that. These are often quite ill-defined. Ill they're defined in terms of their research, but they're difficult to relate directly to a design outcome. So it, it hasn't solved the problem. And we found in the book that we could put lots of references in, but it could be argued that they didn't have a direct design implication. 
there is the second conclusion here is the difficulty in weighting issues, namely um, what happens when there are conflicting issues, just to quote a very simple example, where we've got a, a sunlit room and we want uh, ventilation in it, but that sunlight, <laughs> that room opens onto a, a noisy, polluted street. So we, we need design ingenuity to conflict. And how do we weight the importance of daylight, say, with the importance of ventilation or with the importance of, of um, noise control? Those, those are difficult issues. And what we've said in three is that if the building is adaptive, I think engineers and architects sort of want to get it right. They want to produce a solution, which is it. Whereas actual fact, what we're saying is that we should produce solutions which allow the occupant to adapt it, adapt them to suit themselves. And then they have to make the waiting decisions. It's not a cop out, it's actually what we need for, uh, for mental well-being and physical well-being. That's how we've evolved is to um, adapt the environment and adapt to the environment in order to be comfortable and healthy. And um, I think future environments, so sort of almost linked to that, is that future environment and social uh, developments, meaning in, in terms of buildings really, uh, and, and cities, are, are they need a fail-safe um, performance. In other words, they need to be good enough. And, and I think we should stop talking about kind of optimization and, and talk about safe, safe um, design which is good enough design. And finally, and this, this is a slightly dark thought, that we talk about sustainability. Well, none of us here today, I think, honestly believe that we can go on like we're living today. This is clearly impossible. Um, since I got interested in this subject in the 70s, the world population has doubled. When I found that out, I didn't at first believe it, and it came as an absolute shock. So clearly we are now entering a phase where we're, sustainability like this is, is impossible to think of. So we've really got to think quite differently. And I think survivability would be a better uh, word for it. Okay, thank you. And I'm very, very sorry about all the technical hitches at the beginning. I'm very sorry about that. If it was my fault, I don't know, it probably was. Thank you.